Hey, the next group that we want to talk about for Zoology Lab is the phylum Cnidaria, the Cnidarians. So just a little general information, and let's talk about some common ones. That's all we need to talk about. Um, you remember that what sets the sponges apart is they don't form any of those germ layers. But this is our first group that we're going to study that does form those germ layers, but it only forms two germ layers. It's a diploblast, right? So um, you only form the endoderm and the ectoderm, but no mesoderm. And of course, the sponges don't form any of these. And so this is one of those things that sets this group apart. And here again is that figure that we've looked at that shows that the sponges don't form any germ layers, but the diploblasts form the endoderm and the ectoderm. And if we look at our phylogeny, you can see um, where we have these this group organized. Um, so this is a, a group that's been around for a long time, uh, 700 million years or so. The one characteristic that is really useful for recognizing this group is the presence of nidocytes. And the nidocytes are cells which have these structures called nidi or nidi in them. All right. And there are all kinds of these things, but these are the things that kind of shoot out whenever they're stimulated. And so sometimes they have sticky ends for capturing prey or they have sticky ends for holding on um, so the nidarian can hold in place. And then sometimes they have venom on them. And those are called nematocysts. And we talked about the nematocysts before. And these are the things that are found in, in organisms like jellyfish, um, hydra, uh, sea anemones, uh, any of these that can sting you and it hurts pretty bad. And so this is just a generalized picture showing a hydra and where you would find these nematocysts within this nidocyte. Uh, so the nidocyte is the cell and the nematocyst is the stinging thread that's inside that cell. And you'll recall we talked about how this works, that there's a lot of calcium that gets pumped inside the nidocyte. And so there's a very high osmotic pressure. And so whenever that cap or that operculum is, is uh, bumped, it, the water really wants to rush in quickly. When it rushes in quickly, it inverts this and shoots that stinging thread out. And so here is another figure from your book just kind of showing the generalized hydra body plan and then zooming in and showing you how these nidocytes where they're sort of tucked in and, and gives you a feel for where you're going to find those. But this, this is a characteristic of this phylum. Here's a figure from your book just showing some different kinds. Uh, at the bottom here you've got um, you know, you've got some that are coiled that haven't fired, and then you've got some here that have fired, and they've got different ends on them. And here's a microscope showing some of those that have been fired. Okay, so we have two general body forms within this phylum, and a lot of the organisms will show both. It's uh, both forms are part of their life cycle, and some will only show one. It's the polyp versus the medusa. And so the medusa, you know, think of the hair, uh, the head with hair of snakes. That's the medusa type. And typically when you think of a jellyfish, you're thinking of the medusa form of the jellyfish. And then the polyp type is the sedentary, and it's sort of the same shape but flipped upside down and stuck to the bottom. And so you think of a sea anemone or something like that. And like I said, most of our cnidarians are going to have both of these forms somewhere in their life cycle. And remember that we said that sponges didn't have any kind of symmetry, but these diploblasts, they have radial symmetry. And so you can see that here. They've got a top and a bottom, but they don't really have a left and a right. And so here's an example of a typical life cycle for an cnidarian showing both forms. And so you can see the sedentary, um, where am I at here? You know, you've got your sedentary polyp form, and then this releases free swimming portion that will form a medusa, and then the medusa will sexually reproduce and form a, a larvae, which will sink to the bottom and attach and become a polyp form again. And so they don't all do this, 
um, but this is a general thing that you're going to see in this group. Um, you remember that the sponges didn't have any tissues, but their cells were able to communicate. So they were starting to see some coordination among the cells. Now, from, from the cnidarians and the rest of the animals, we do have tissues, and we are starting to see specialized cells that are forming the tissue. Um, the cnidarians don't have a central nervous system, but they do have a nerve net. So this is probably the first organisms to have an, you know, any kind of nervous tissue. And this nerve net has a bunch of nerves that can sort of pass signals to one another, but there's no centralized nerve system. Now, usually when we have uh, later organisms, when we see bilateral symmetry with cephalization, where you have a head, that's when you also start to see a centralized nervous system. But these guys just have this nervous net. Um, it's interesting because in, in the nerves in the cnidarian nervous system, the signal can travel in either direction. Um, and you'll find out why that's interesting because when we talk about how our nerves work, our nerves, the signal only goes in one direction. But these, are, um, uh, these organisms have radial symmetry. And so having a signal that can travel in either direction is probably an advantage to something that doesn't really have a left or a right. You know, direction is kind of, doesn't have as much meaning to them or doesn't mean the same thing to them as it does to us. Um, what's interesting is you can see remnants of this nerve net in like our digestive system. And so if you look at the um, intestines of a human, you're going to see this net of nerves that controls, um, you know, the muscles and controls the peristalsis that's within your digestive system. But it's not really um, as much connected to the central nervous system as it's just this net of nerves that talk to one another. And this is probably, um, you know, a remnant of our early ancestor with the Cnidarians. Okay, I'm just going to show you some typical examples. Many of these are organisms with which you are familiar and should be pretty easy for you when you recognize these to, to recognize what they are and, and that they are in the phylum Cnidaria. Jellyfish are the first example um, and here we're showing the Medusa form which is pretty typical of what you're going to see. A lot of these jellyfish of course, um, the have both forms, and this is what this figure from your book is trying to show. It's trying to show that that Medusa form that we're most familiar with is just one part of the life stage of most of the jellyfish, and that they do have uh, a polyp form as well that um, uh, is sedentary and grows and then releases the Medusa form. Here's a really interesting one, the Portuguese man of war. Uh, again, these are, you know, really dangerous. They've got a really strong sting. It's got maybe a neurotoxin on it. Um, and so this is swimmers are very aware of these things. This is actually um, not one organism, but many organisms existing in a colony. And so again, we're back to that theme that we've been talking about. We've been talking about like, you know, individual unicellular organisms that live in a colony and sort of coordinate. And then we talked about uh, you know, the sponges, and you've got these cells that, that don't really have a tight relationship, but they do coordinate, but they're not individual organisms. They're cells of the same organism. And here you've got like different organisms, and you've got both the polyp and medusa forms, and they're living as a colony to form this one sort of large um, mega organism. It's, again, this is why biology is so cool. It's fascinating, all the different kinds of life that are out there. But this is just another cnidarian. You see it's got this big um, crest and this uh, big bladder that allows it to float at the surface. But, um, uh, you know, those tentacles that hang below have the nematocysts on there. And so if you were to rub against this, you'd get a, a pretty nasty sting. I believe there's been, you know, evidence of a couple people that have gotten killed by these things. Uh, okay, sea anemones. Again, something that can be dangerous if you brush against it. It's got the stinging nematocysts. Um, but here, whereas the jellyfish, we, we most commonly think of the medusa form, the sea anemone, um, you know, we, we're mostly familiar with the polyp form, which is what we see here. Um, and so you've got the tentacles that point up and the mouth in the middle. And this is just a figure from your book, kind of showing you a cutaway and show, giving you a feel for how these things are designed. 
And so you've got the blind gut that we talked about. So you only have one opening and, and food goes in that opening and wastes leave that opening. Um, and you've got the tentacles that have the stinging nematocyst. Now you would think something like a sea anemone, this polyp form, to us would appear to be pretty sedentary, um, but they are able to move. And here's a, a picture from your book of a starfish trying to attack a sea anemone. And the sea anemone, like, I guess you couldn't call it running away, but getting away. So they're not completely sedentary. They do have the ability to move. Um, obviously, they don't move all that well. Um, of course, here's a clownfish that has a symbiotic relationship with sea anemones. Uh, this is a, you know, a popular uh, fish in a popular relationship. And so the question becomes, how can this clownfish live amongst those tentacles if they do have those stinging threads? Um, the most likely explanation is they have a much thicker mucus coat. And so although they get stung, it doesn't penetrate that mucus coat. And that's how they're able to tolerate and living, you know, amongst the tentacles of the sea anemone. Um, the sea anemone benefits because the, um, the fish, uh, you know, uh, aerates the water, brings fresh water in, which probably brings in fresh food. As the fish eat, it probably drops food in there. So it probably improves the water quality and gives the sea anemone some, some food. The, the fish benefits because it's a very protected place. You know, other predators aren't going to be able to come in there because they will get stung by the sea anemone. But uh, it's probably that mucus coating that the clownfish has. Um, corals are also found in the phylum Cnidaria. Um, and here's some beautiful examples. And again, this is one of those things where at first blush, you don't realize that it's an, a living organism. Well enough, it's an animal. But if you kind of look at a coral up close, it makes a lot more sense. And if you look at this figure from your book, you can see the similarities with sea anemones, right? It's a polyp form, and uh, you can see the, the general shape of the living coral is very similar to a sea anemone. And just what's different is that they secrete this hard exoskeleton. And so they take in calcium carbonate from the water and excrete this hard shell. And then at some point, the organism dies and the soft, gooey inner part, you know, dissolves and, and decays. But of course, the hard shell is left behind. And then new corals will grow on top of that. And that's how you build a coral reef. So a coral reef is, is a very hard structure, but it's the leftover exoskeletons from these corals, which are in the same um, phylum. Now, we talked about corals before, and we talked about their symbiotic relationship with um, dinoflagellates. And we said that uh, you know, one of the things that we're starting to notice more is that as the planet warms up and as the water warms up, this stresses out these corals. And it's probably part of their immune system response when they get stressed as sort of a last ditch effort to try to keep themselves alive. They expel their dinoflagellates. Um, again, this probably makes sense from their um, immune system point of view that if the coral is stressed and maybe the dinoflagellate is producing a toxin or it's dying or there's something causing, you know, it's a likely explanation for why the coral would be stressed. And so expelling the dinoflagellate might be a, a last ditch um, thing to, to make them better. Um, but of course, it's a symbiotic relationship. They need those dinoflagellates. Um, they need that oxygen. They need those molecules that are produced by those protozoans. So um, this bleaching of coral ultimately is going to lead to the coral's death. And this is something that, that scientists are concerned about, that the warming water, you're seeing a lot more um, dying coral. And the coral and coral reefs are incredibly important to the diversity of organisms in the ocean. These are biodiversity hotspots. And so when the coral dies, then lots of other organisms go with them. Okay, um, so up to this point, all our examples have been um, marine animals. There are some freshwater cnidarians. For example, there's a freshwater jellyfish, which believe it or not, we can find here in Kentucky. Now, it's not supposed to be here in Kentucky. This freshwater jellyfish that I'm showing you here is originally from China, 
and it is uh, you know an alien species here in Kentucky but it can be found here in Kentucky and there are some other a few other um, freshwater cnidarians like Hydra that we're going to look at in the lab and so we do have some of these in Kentucky. Okay, that's just a brief intro to the Nidarians. Let me know if you got any questions, and we're going to look at a lot of these in lab this week. See ya.